The following question reads that uh, the element in group 2 show trends in the properties that are typical of metals. The elements of group 17 show trends in the properties that are typical of non-metals. So state and explain the trend in ionization energy down group 2. So we're talking about uh, removing electrons. So we have to discuss the trend in ionization energies down group 2. So I've drawn over here the example of beryllium and uh, magnesium. I've also answered the question, but let me first explain to you. As you move down the group, uh, the number of valence electrons remain the same, but the shells keep on increasing. So what happens is uh, that ionization energy, what is ionization energy? It's the, it's the energy required to remove an electron. So since these electrons are closer to the nucleus, the nucleus is right in the middle. So there's a positive nucleus right in the middle. So if the atom is smaller, electrons are very close to the nucleus and there's less shielding effect. Uh, but as you move away from the nucleus, the electrons are now further away from the nucleus and there are lots of electrons coming in between the nucleus and these outer electrons. So what happens is that ionization energy decreases down group 2. Because atomic radius increases, you have bigger atoms, it becomes easier to lose electrons. And shielding effect also increases. These outer electrons and the nucleus, there are lots of electrons coming in between. So they're going to shield the nucleus and the attraction for the outer electrons would decrease. So it's going to become easier to remove an electron. So ionization energy would decrease down group 2 because atomic radius increases and shielding effect also increases. Now moving to the next part of the question which is uh, part B strain and explain the trend in melting points uh, down group 17. So group 17 is uh, fluorine. So you have a molecule of fluorine, you have a molecule of chlorine, then you have a molecule of uh, bromine and, and so on. Uh, this is a gas, the first one is a gas, the second one is also a gas. The third one is actually a liquid, it's a red-brown liquid. And if I draw iodine at the bottom, that's a solid. So one thing that you can notice is that uh, the melting points increase. They increase down the group. Things are becoming more solid. So melting points are increasing. So they increase down group 17. And what's the reason for the increase? Remember, these are simple molecules. You'll have a molecule of fluorine and you'll have another molecule of fluorine. Uh, now, fluorine molecules are non-polar. So, the, for example, over here, I've drawn two fluorine molecules. Fluorine molecules are non-polar. They don't have permanent dipoles. The only force of attraction between them is going to be Van der Waals forces. So, uh, melting points increase down group 17 because Van der Waals forces, or you can call them temporary dipole induced dipoles, they increase as down the group you have bigger molecules as molecule size increases so why do van der waals forces increase because as you move down the group the molecule has more electrons so there's the more chances of temporary dipole induced dipoles being formed for example iodine over here has a total of around uh, 100 electrons so if 100 electrons fluctuate move left and right in random fashion the, permanent, the temporary dipoles that would be formed would be very strong. Fluorine just has 18 electrons in total. This molecule over here has a total of 18 electrons. So if 18 electrons fluctuate randomly in collisions, the partial negative and partial positive charges are not going to be very strong. So the attraction between one molecule and the other molecule is going to be weaker in the case of fluorine, but very strong in the case of iodine. Moving now to the next part of the question, uh, which now states the melting point decreases down group 2. And we have to explain this trend. The first thing you should know is that uh, group 2, they're all metals. So we're talking about metallic bonding. Now I've drawn the structure of a metallic bond. In metallic bonding, it's a giant metallic lattice where you have lots of positive metal ions. Metals like to lose electrons. So they all form positive ions and there would be delocalized electrons around them. And there would be attraction between the delocalized electrons and the positive metal ions. So what happens as you move uh, down the group? The only difference that's going to happen is, remember group 2, all the metal ions would have a charge of plus 2. And all each metal ion would have uh, two electrons, they would be lost or delocalized. Two outer electrons would be lost in group 2. So this applies to the entire group 2, whether it's barium or calcium or magnesium. Uh, the ion, the positive ion would always be plus 2 and there would be two electrons that would be delocalized by each atom. 
So what happens as you move down group uh, 2, the only difference would be that the size of the atom or the size of the ion is going to be bigger. So here I've drawn uh, a similar metallic lattice. The only difference now is that the size of the ion, as you move down the group, the size of the ion is going to be bigger. Down the group, uh, the size of the atom increases. There are more shells. So you have a bigger giant ionic uh, metallic lattice. Uh, but they, over here, the bonds are going to be weaker because it's the same uh, number of electrons, uh, delocalized electrons, and the charge of the ion is still plus two. Uh, the, the attraction between the ions and the electrons would be lesser because of the bigger size. The distances have now become greater, so the attraction would be weaker. Over here, the distances between the ions and the delocalized electrons were smaller, so the attraction between the ions and the delocalized electrons was stronger which is why metallic bonding would be weaker for bigger ions. There would be greater distance, lesser attraction. So metallic bonding is going to be weaker for bigger ions. And this is what we are going to write why the melting point decreases because the metallic bonding uh, and, the, and its strength decreases because of the bigger ions. So I've written the statement, which is that down group two, ionic radius increases, spe specifically cationic radius increases, and there's lesser charge density of the metal ion, bigger ions, uh, the positive charge would be more distributed, so there's going to be lesser charge density and lesser attraction between metal ions and the delocalized electrons, so weaker metallic bonds would be present, which is why melting point decreases down group 2. Moving now to the next part of the question, which is that some reactions based on group 2 metal barium are shown. So uh, these reactions are shown and state the reagents needed for reactions 1 and 2. So there's reaction 1. Let's focus on reaction one first. So you had a barium metal and it got converted into a salt, barium nitrate and hydrogen gas. Now metals only do that with acids. Uh, metal plus acid produces salt plus H2, hydrogen gas. The acid in this case is going to be nitric acid, HNO3. So barium plus, so the reagent needed would be nitric acid. So HNO3 would be needed. And let's look at reaction two. Barium is reacting and it's producing a metal hydroxide and hydrogen gas again. Now, metals react with water. If you add H2O to a metal, they produce a hydroxide and H2. Now, barium is, in, is down group two, so it's very reactive. So it would probably react with cold water uh, at, a, at a very decent rate. So barium plus H2O would produce barium hydroxide plus hydrogen gas would be given off. So over here, it's going to be the reagent would be H2O. The next part now states that uh, we have to name X and write an equation for its formation. So let's look at the reaction. Barium is being heated in air. Now the only element that is reactive in air is oxygen O2, which means it's a reaction between barium and oxygen and the ox uh, compound that would be formed would be barium. Oxide, a metal oxide would be formed. So uh, let's complete that. The name of the compound is going to be barium oxide and the equation would be that you would have barium reacting with O2 and it would produce barium oxide and you need to balance this so there would be two barium oxide molecules and two barium atoms. Part 3 of the question now states that barium nitrate is produced by the action 1 is heated to dryness. Uh, so barium nitrate produced is heated to dryness. The anhydrous solid is then heated strongly and decomposes. So barium oxide is produced together with two other products. Identify the two other products of this decomposition reaction state what would be observed. So what you're doing is uh, you have barium nitrate and you're heating it, uh, the anhydrous solid, which means without water. So I can make an equation. Remember all nitrates, all group 2 nitrates, they're going to decompose in the same way. So when you heat a nitrate, it decomposes, ends up producing barium oxide, plus two NO2 gas molecules would be produced and half O2 gas molecules are going to be produced. So, so uh, identify the two other products of this decomposition. He's already mentioned barium oxide together with two other products. The two other products are going to be NO2, nitrogen dioxide and oxygen gas. These would be my two other products. Let's now move to part four. Uh, you know, given state, what, we, what would be observed when excess magnesium sulfate is added to barium hydroxide aqueous produced in the reaction to explain your answer. Now, this is an example of ionic precipitation. Now, if you add magnesium sulfate and barium hydroxide aqueous, remember they're both aqueous. 
Uh, compounds, when they are aqueous, when they dissolve in water, they dissociate. Remember, it's an ionic compound. Uh, the solid has plus 2 and negative 2 ions, they would all be joined together. It's going to be a giant ionic lattice where lots of positive and negative ions, they would all be uh, joined together. But when you dissolve them in water, the lattice uh, scatters and dissociates and the ions then become mixed with water. So, for example, I have uh, magnesium sulfate. This is a beaker and it contains water. And if I mix MgSO4, Mg plus 2 ions and SO4 minus 2 ions, they would all scatter in water. They would dissociate and all the ions would be randomly mixed in water. Similarly, barium hydroxide is also aqueous. If you mix barium hydroxide in, um, in water, it's also going to dissociate. So you'll have uh, the solution would contain lots of barium ions and lots of OH ions. They would all be scattered around. So all these OH ions, barium ions, etc., they would all be scattered around in the solution, dissociated form. So this is what happens uh, when uh, you mix uh, a salt and a base. They, they, remember, they, there's no reaction that you have studied. A base does not react with the salt in the conventional way. So what's going to happen is ionic precipitation. Both of the ions are going to mix around in the solution. Now, these ions are going to randomly combine with each other. Remember, um, a positive ion would always combine with a negative ion. They are going to attract each other. So don't combine two positive ions together or two negative ions together. So these ions would be mixing around, randomly colliding with each other, and they would be joining with each other. Now what happens is, if uh, Mg and OH ions, they combine. So there are lots of Mg and OH ions in the solution. Uh, so if Mg and OH ions combine, uh, remember Mg OH2 is insoluble. So they would start forming a precipitate at the bottom of Mg OH2, which is insoluble. And it's a solid. So all these magnesium ions, and all these uh, OH ions, they would start forming a solid MgOH2. And the same pretty much would happen with the barium ions and sulfate ions as well, if they start combining with each other. So for example, these barium ions and sulfate ions, if they start combining with each other. Barium sulfate is also insoluble, so they would start forming a precipitate at the bottom of BaSO4 which is going to be in solid state. So barium sulfate is also insoluble, GOH2 is also insoluble. So this is called precipitation. Uh, if you mix two of these soluble uh, substances, the ions are going to mix around and they're going to randomly combine with each other and they would start forming these insoluble precipitates of barium sulfate and magnesium hydroxide. And both of these precipitates would be white solids because uh, group two compounds are white in color. So the answer to this question would be that white precipitates would be formed of magnesium hydroxide and also barium sulfate because both of them are insoluble.